after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached, approached Bethage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead, who was, who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to, to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, Jem. Good morning, everyone. If you haven't met before, my name's Charlie. I'm curate here, and it's <coughs> wonderful to gather together, whether in person or on Zoom. Now, who wants to hear? Who wants to hear some big news? I'm afraid I haven't got any big news for you. I've got massive news. We have got an actual king, an actual king coming to visit us this morning. Royalty itself. Now, if you've got a king coming, I think you all know that before they come, we need to stand up on our feet and make ourselves ready. So do you want to stand up? You don't have to do this if you don't want to play along. Stand up. Now, just check the person next to you. Make sure they're nice and smart. Because this is a king coming. We've got to honor them. And, and when, we, when they come in, I think they're going to arrive on some kind of massive chariot, maybe a stretch limousine, you know, like the beast that Obama used to ride in on. I think they're going to come on, on something like that. When they come in, when we see them, we will have to bow down low to the ground, low to the ground, because they're a king, okay? And we'll, we'll you know, if you can just bear just having a peek up and see the king in an amazing splendor. Are you ready? I think he's nearly here. Are you ready? I can't say. Are we all ready? Okay, I think we are. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome with me King Nicholas of Edgbaston. Bow to your, bow to your knees, everyone. Here comes King Nicholas now. Be careful. Don't look at him too closely. He might... He's, he's, he has great authority. Look, I, I, why are you all laughing at him? King Nicholas. We've been, we've been longing for you to come. I needed a little, a little skid at the end. What a, what a privilege for us. We can all sit down, can't we? King Nicholas, please, please do take your seat. You're, you're, we're very honoured to have you with us. Is that a bit weird? Is that a bit ridiculous? You were all laughing. He was riding on a bike. But he was a king. I told you he was King Nicholas of Edgbaston. Now that is a little bit like what happens in today's Bible story. When Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, you'd think if he was a king, which like everyone you know, around him thinks he is, he would come in some great chariot, the equivalent of a stretch limousine in those days, with like, I don't know, six horses pulling him and him standing, waving triumphantly. If you've ever seen like a Roman emperor arriving in a film, that's how they arrive. Jesus comes riding sort of the equivalent of a kid's bike. It's a donkey, but it's not even a donkey. It's a little donkey. It's a, it's a baby donkey, really. A colt, the foal of a donkey. It doesn't make any sense, except it did to the people present. Because they remembered something that they'd read. They were all Jewish people. They read something in their Bibles, the Old Testament as we call it today. Ollie, can you put it up on the screen? From Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is God's king and here in, in this bit of the Bible we're reading, he comes as king to like the royal city, Jerusalem. But he's a very special sort of king. 
He's promised long, long, long ago in bits like Zechariah chapter 9. And he's a king who is humble. If you look at him coming, if you see him walking around Jerusalem, you'd have probably thought he wasn't anything special. You might have been tempted to laugh at him like we found it a bit funny laughing at Nick as he came in. But as we're going to discover in this new series that we're going to be doing all the way up to Easter, well, the wonder of Easter is all about the wonder of the sort of king that Jesus is. We're going to discover that here in church. Kids, if you're age 3 to 11 at least, please do go to the back now. Your leaders will meet you and you're going to discover the same things over in St. Monica's. So while the kids are leaving, why don't we take the opportunity to say hello to someone next to us if we haven't met them before or give them a little wave across the, across the aisles and then I will uh, come back together in just a couple of moments and we can carry on. Right then, let's carry on, shall we? The, the idea that here in um, Luke chapter 19, we have a king who is this person with great authority that coming in humility. In one sense, I think, makes it a bit easier for us as sort of 21st century people to make some sense of this. But if you look at some of the details of this reading, one of the things that's most, most difficult about it, I think, for us, is that Jesus, if you like, seems to orchestrate this whole situation in order to get the praise of all the people who are there and he doesn't kind of put them off or deny it. So the stuff at the beginning of the reading, if you heard it, when he goes and sends some disciples of his to go and find this donkey, it's incredibly sort of brazen of him. <coughs> go to that particular village, get that donkey. If anyone asks, you say the, the master needs it. And they do it, and they find it exactly as he plans, as he says they would. And then he sits on the donkey and goes in. Now, clearly, he is sort of arranging things so that people will be thinking of the Zechariah 9 thing, which seems to be, you know, what happens. Because when, when they see him coming in, when his followers, they, they seem to kind of get in on it. They start putting cloaks on the ground to express his authority over them. He could, he could walk over them if he wanted to. And maybe most of all, right towards the end of the reading, Jesus does something very, very un-English. The Pharisees, they hear what people are saying about him, that he is this king who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Verse 40, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. It's un-English because whenever we get complimented as English people, we have to deflect it, don't we? Jesus doesn't deflect it at all. He says, look, these people here, they're calling me their king, They've ha hardly begun to realize the authority I have. Really, it should be, you know, all of creation, the rocks, declaring how great I am. Jesus, if you like, sets this whole scene up, and he doesn't shy away from the fact that he is the one with this unparalleled authority. He doesn't try and deflect it, when the Pharisees say, no, no, dude, come on, they shouldn't be saying that. He says, they haven't even begun to see how great I am. And that's more than, I think, just a challenge to our sort of Englishness. It's a, it's a challenge, I think, to the way that, well, because of the way that we today would typically think about power. Here is a single individual who's claiming for himself enormous unparalleled, matchless power. And we find that very difficult because of the way that through history we've seen people who have power misuse it, abuse it with terrible consequences. If we're going to have a single individual who has this kind of monarch thing, who is a king, a, a sovereign, well either we'll make them like our monarch, the queen, a figurehead, Someone who is there to sort of keep the constitution together, but has no actual power of their own. You might remember David Cameron said when, he, when, when the Scottish independence referendum was coming up, 
he asked the queen to just raise an eyebrow to try and help the, you know, the, the anti-independence cause. And it caused an incredible stir because you think the queen can't do that. We can't have any individual who's unelected with power over us. When you see people, individuals who have this sort of power, well, it works out in the sort of ways we're seeing horrifically in Ukraine at the moment. Monarchs, if you like, single individuals with all the power going through them. In our world, they can only ever turn out to be despots. And yet here is Jesus making that kind of extraordinary claim for himself. I'm a king. I'm not going to deny you worshipping me as a king, waving your palm branches, saluting me, heralding me. So how do we make sense of that today? Is this a, is this a sort of outdated image? I, I have to say, when I think about the kind of king stuff in the Bible, I do find it hard to, to get into. It feels like something of an older time. We don't, we don't do that anymore. How can we make sense of Jesus' claim to this kingly authority as we journey together through Luke's gospel to Easter? Well, on the one hand, I want to just sort of draw us back, call, call to mind again some of the things that we were learning in the book of Exodus. And particularly how in Exodus we, we saw, do you remember, a number of times it came up, the idea that though we don't call them kings, we all have these, if, you, if I can put it this way, authorities in our lives that we listen to and obey. In Exodus, there's sort of the, the, the images, the, 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 the metaphors, the words that we use were around idols and around gods. But I think they amount to the same sort of thing. Things in your lives that, that pull on you, that call out from you, you allegiance, even worship. So the things that we don't freely choose, we don't elect them into positions of authority in our lives, they're just there. And we find them pulling at our hearts and, and calling for our allegiance. When it comes to our, if you like, democratic politics, it is of the utmost importance that our, our votes, when we, when we vote for our leaders, are free and uncoerced. But that's not quite how it works, if you like, in our hearts, in our lives, day to day. We might want to tell ourselves that we're sort of free agents and we choose who will be authorities over us. Well, one of the things we saw over and over again in the book of Exodus is that just, that just isn't the way that the human heart is, like, is constituted, the, 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 the way it actually works. Do you remember with the, with the people of Israel? They, they got out of Egypt, and yet Egypt was still in them. It still had a pull on their hearts. Last week at the 11 o'clock service, we were thinking about the temptations of Jesus, a typical thing that we do in, in this season of Lent, and we were thinking more generally about how temptation works and how we can resist temptation. But that whole idea that there are, there are we, we experience temptations speaks to this very same point. I gave the example last week at 11 o'clock. Well, two examples. On the one hand, Matt Hancock, who you, you might have seen his interview that he gave talking about the affair he had with an aide in the, in the midst of lockdown. And he said, although he, he broke the rules, although they were guidelines at the time, he said, that was a serious thing that I, I broke the rules. But he said about his aid, we fell in love, and that's something that was completely outside of my control. You see, at that very moment, he was basically saying, I, I had this authority over me I could do nothing about. Now, in all kinds of ways, people said, really? Is that, is that the way that you're going to talk about what you did? But in one sense, I guess, as a politician, he had some sense that that sort of answer would make some sense to people. Because when you fall in love, it is outside of your control in one sense. I gave the example also of, of Jane Eyre, the famous literary character. When she is approached by her suitor, who himself is already married, but you know, basically wants out and wants to be with Jane, there's a moment where we kind of get on the inside of Jane's thoughts in a really extraordinary way, and she talks about the battle that she experiences. She says this, 
while he spoke, while he's kind of basically coming on to her, my very conscience and reason turned traitors against me and charged me with crime in resisting him. They spoke almost as loud as feeling and that clamored, clamored wildly. Oh, comply, it said. Think of his misery. Think of his danger. Look at his state when left alone. Remember his headlong nature. Consider the recklessness following on despair. Soothe him, save him, love him. Tell him you love him and, and will be his. Who in the world cares for you? It goes on and on with Jane basically battling this incredibly powerful voice telling her she should do this. In both those cases, and in our own lives, I think it works out the same. It's not as simple as we are these kind of free, neutral agents deciding who we're going to listen to, which voices are going to you know, have the volume turned up on us. They just come at us. They just declare authority over our lives. So the question as we come to think about Jesus as a king is not so much how can we have a king over us? How can we have this authority over our lives? It's not so much that question as what kind of king will we have? If we're not free, completely neutral agents, but are, are faced all kinds of authorities, what kind of king do we want? What sort of authority will be good for us? What sort of king will we bow down to? And that's where this story of the triumphal entry, and actually I think the whole of what's coming up as we journey through Luke's gospel up to Easter and through it. In one sense, the whole point of this is, is to show us that Jesus is the most wonderful authority the most wonderful king, that you have to bow to something, bow to him, because he's like no other king, no other authority. Just two things from t today's reading that particularly, I think, drive that point home. The first is that he's a king who brings peace, and he brings peace at the most profound, most enormous level. Did you hear what the crowds say? Where as he's traveling into Jerusalem on this donkey, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Peace in heaven. When he was born, the angels came and declared peace on earth. And in some ways, this is even more, this is even greater. For these J J Jewish listeners, hearers, praisers, worshipers here, heaven was the biggest thing they could think of. Heaven is the enormous expanse above them. They're saying something amazing, mind-blowing. And heaven is the place where God lives. And so peace in heaven is talking about the whole of reality back into the harmony that it was in at the beginning of the world. God relating perfectly, wonderfully, beautifully with his creation. And all the things that ruin that harmony, all the discord, all the suffering, all the pain, gone away. What Jesus is going to come and do as he enters Jerusalem is bring about that peace. A peace that goes far, far, far beyond the end of war, as much as we desperately long for that, particularly at the moment. It goes far, far, far beyond that, because it goes far, far, far beyond just human relationships being put right, though it includes that. By putting us back into right relationship with the God who made us, Jesus, if you like, goes, goes beyond our wildest dreams in making peace. I suppose the question then is, can other kings offer this? Can other authorities offer this level, this level, this magnitude of peace and harmony of the world put right. I guess inevitably my mind was drawn at this thought of peace to what's going on in Ukraine. I've been reading a bit about some of the um, sort of testimonies, particularly of Christians who have been working in Syria since the start of the civil war there. Various groups who have been seeking to, to do good and to alleviate some of the suffering. One story that particularly stayed with me 
a story of a, a, a Christian group working just before the Russian army arrived to support the Syrian regime in the civil war there. And when people heard the Russians were arriving, the, think, the th thinking was, we need to get out. We, we can't even risk having sort of Westerners in the country at the same time as the Russian army. It could sort of spark a diplomatic incident. And so with tears in their eyes, this group of Christians left the country. They, they, they fled across the border. One of the people who was part of that group, um, she, she wrote a, a very moving sort of reflection on what it looks like to, to, to sort of meet the needs of those in combat in the midst of conflict and war and suffering and to do so as a Christian. And, and her words are extraordinary. I, they're sort of words that I couldn't say myself because they, they'd sound very glib. But when c coming from her, who was, who was in the midst of meeting all kinds of desperate, deep needs that, that warfare brings about in particular. This is what she said. Jesus and his plan for reconstruction is the only hope powerful enough to survive the ravages of the worst sufferings this age can devise. While mercy relieves and encourages, while bright spots remind us of the goodness of created order and the one who marshals matter, while we are responsible to love our neighbors, we have multiple daily reminders of how fleeting these sweet moments are, how punctuated with sorrow. Yes, we will be right in the midst of development in Syria, bringing health, education, and community development resources to those who've been left bereft. But every program is held loosely, knowing that it is human beings, not relief organizations, that will last when the kingdom comes. Infinitely more important than new schools in the suburbs of Damascus are Syrians who are longing for the day of the Lord. She understands that her work is so, so important, and yet there's a much bigger work that needs to happen. The day of the Lord needs to come. Peace to reign from the highest to the lowest, through every, every part of society. And only Jesus Christ can bring that about. So, he's a king who brings peace. And secondly, he's a king who, king who brings peace by giving away his power. And that might be the most extraordinary thing about this journey with Jesus we're going to go on in Jerusalem. In one sense, it, the fact that Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding, riding on a donkey in the light of Zechariah 9, isn't so much a sort of surprise to his Jewish audience here. But it is a surprise to us, because this isn't how kings are supposed to behave. You think, if this is such a, a vast program to bring peace, then surely you're going to need to apply some force to get it done. That's always the challenge in our world. If you want to do big, big good, if you want to bring about real change, inevitably people get bulldozed because that's just what big government programs look like. But somehow the wonder of Easter is Jesus pursues that enormous <coughs> program, bringing peace between us and God, bringing peace at every level of reality. But he does it not by <laughs> applying more force, escalating more violence, bringing more, more, more power to bear but by giving it away. This donkey that he rides in on, if you like, is of a piece. It's, 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 it's of the same, cut of the same fabric as the rest of this journey he takes. And, you know, we know where it goes. That he ends up, if you like, outside the city again. Here he is coming into the city. He ends up on the outside of the city as a traitor, as a criminal. And just got rid of like a piece of garbage in the end. And yet that is the way, the extraordinary way in which this program for the whole of humanity, the whole of reality being put right again, that's how it comes about. So Napoleon Bonaparte, a big dictator of, of his day, put it like this during his exile. I know men and I tell you that Jesus Christ is not a man. Well, perhaps he had that wrong, but listen. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. 
There is between Christianity and whatever other religion the distance of infinity. Christ, having but a few weak disciples, was condemned to death. He died the object of the wrath of the Jewish priests and of the contempt of the nation and abandoned and denied by his own disciples. You speak of Caesar, of Alexander, of their conquests, of the enthusiasm which they enkindled in the hearts of their soldiers. But can you conceive of a dead man making conquests with an army faithful and entirely devoted to his memory? My armies have forgotten me already. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But upon what did, did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of people would die for him. The question we have is not so much, shall we have a king over us? The question is, what kind of king? And here in Jesus Christ, we have a king who makes the most astounding claim about what he can offer, peace in heaven. Can your other kings deliver like that? And he does it by dying. Will your other kings die for you? Or will they not rather make you die for them? Jesus Christ is a king like no other. And though initially we might find that a, a difficult thing, when we come to see that we all have kings, the question is what kind of king, then I hope we can see, and I hope we will see as we go through this series, that Jesus is a king worth bowing the knee to and worshipping with every fibre of our being. We're going to come to Jesus in prayer. I'm going to lead us in some prayers of intercession, but let's just be quiet, shall we, for a few moments before I do that.